Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I will wait one or two minutes um, for other people to join before giving you a short introduction to today's event. So thank you for your patience. And I will be with you very shortly. Thanks to those of you who are continuing to join. I'm going to wait just one or two more minutes. Great. So without further ado, um, good day, everybody. I know that we're welcoming people from all over the world today. So um, it's very, very nice to have you here. Um, first of all, uh, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm the chair and moderator of today's event. My name is Louise Taylor, and I'm the Asia Pacific representative at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Um, I'm absolutely super grateful, actually, to be able to moderate today's um, event, which comes on the back of some really excellent hard work, some collaboration and engagement over the last uh, 12 months, especially. Virginia Komoli, the research manager of the Anticipating and Disrupting Environmental Crime in the Global Economy Program here at GI Talk, has really worked hard to get under the skin of this issue and how the exponential trade in plastic waste could be and is being exploited in numerous ways by multiple actors across the globe to the detriment of our people and our planet. And she will tell you more about what she uncovered in her Plastics for Profit report shortly. But Virginia's work also builds upon and supports the intense hard work and consistent efforts of others who have dedicated both their professional and personal lives in some respects to this cause. And two of those people are also here with us today. Yuyun Ismawati is senior advisor and co-founder of Nexus 3 Foundation, which was built on the foundations of Bali Focus, which Yuyun founded in 2009. Yuyun is actively involved in a number of different coalitions and NGO networks at both the national and international level, and has more than 25 years of experience in advocating policies and regulation for the elimination and control of toxic hazardous materials. And in 2009, Yu Yun was rightly recognized for her important role in this field and won the Goldman Prize in Environmental Award for Pollution and Waste Issues. We also have Willie Wilson with us here today. Willie is currently the Vice Chair and Private Sector Engagement Lead of Interpol's Pollution Crime Working Group, as well as visiting scholar at the Environmental Law Institute, ELI, in Washington, DC, and a consultant with the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement. Um, prior to this, Willie worked in law enforcement and the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, gathering over 40 years of experience in policing, environmental regulation, and tackling international transnational waste and maritime pollution crime. 
in all of these roles and including in his interactions with us here at the GI Talk, Willie has consistently brought his passion as well as his practical experience as a regulator and criminal investigator, policymaker and advocate to tackling international waste and pollution crime matters. In fact, it was with Willie quite a few moons ago now that I discussed how the issue of plastic waste and its exploitation and the resultant harms it inflicts on vulnerable populations is sometimes seen as a bit niche or the poor cousin of other bigger or badder crimes. But what you'll hear today is that this is big and it is bad. And it's importantly, it's not going away. That is, unless policymakers and regulators and law enforcement agencies are able to intervene and to alter the trajectory and the activities of the trade. It is our hope at GI Talk <clears throat> that our findings can be used to support further and more activist interventions and actions. And I know the panel members are ready and eager to talk through these ideas with you. I will therefore stop speaking and hand over to Virginia, who will talk us through her recent report and then hand over to Yuyun and then to Willie respectively. We'll then open the floor to all of you um, for an audience-wide Q&A session. Please use the, the, the functions at the bottom of the screen in order to do that. Um, and I will moderate that uh, going forwards. As I said, drop the comments and questions in the chat box or the Q&A. We'll aim to monitor that throughout the discussion. I should tell you this session is being live streamed on our YouTube channel at the moment and also recorded. So please be aware of that in your interventions. Thank you for your attention and your uh, attendance and your patience. And Virginia, please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen now. I hope you can you can see it all right. Well, hello everyone. It's uh, really it's a great pleasure to be able to present uh, the uh, the findings of our work on on illicit trade in plastic waste. And some of you are familiar with the work that we do at GI. My find this to be a slightly unusual topic. But actually, we've been looking at the evidence, and, and that evidence shows that the transnational illicit trade in plastic waste poses some very serious criminal, environmental, and also human, um, human health risk. And if we look into the future, if we look ahead, we think that addressing this problem should be indeed an urgent priority. And, and this is because of the increasing illegality in the waste trade also because of the constant diversification of the illicit uh, trade routes that are used, and also because of the sophistication of the business operations that make illegal waste trade possible. So before, before turning to my, uh, to my colleagues, I will then spend the next few minutes uh, providing an overview of the context we are in vis-a-vis -vis waste uh, production, plastic waste production, and then explain what makes some uh, plastic waste illicit. And then I will look into the criminal activities that are carried out along the supply chain from countries where waste is produced all the way uh, to the countries where it is finally uh, disposed. So where we are at. So in the world, we produce a huge amount of waste. You know, about 2 billion metric tons of waste are produced yearly. Only a very small percentage of that waste is recycled. And even a tinier percentage of that is actually recycled in the West. And the same applies to uh, plastic waste production, whose uh, generation has actually grown um, substantially uh, owing to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But waste is also a big business. You know, the, the global market for recycled plastics was estimated to be uh, in the region of 35 billion US dollars in 2016, and is growing to the point that it is, it is expected to surpass uh, the 50 billion uh, marks. Uh, by next uh, next year. And of course, like all very lucrative uh, markets, criminals are drawn to it. Uh, the other very important point to, to be made at the outset is that you know, in Europe, in North America, so the regions that are the largest plastic waste producers, uh, we have tiny uh, re domestic recycling capacity. And therefore, for a long time, we have shipped the majority of our waste abroad to emerging and developing countries. 
And this results in um, a catch-22 situation for those receiving countries, because on the one hand, there is a financial incentive to receive that plastic waste, because once it's processed and turned into plastic pallets and flakes, it becomes raw material, which can then be sold on to manufacturing uh, companies. So it's appealing. But at the same time, most, uh, most of the times, these countries actually lack sophisticated enough facilities to process any waste other than clean plastic waste. So whenever they receive mixed plastics, uh, hazardous uh, plastic, i.e. plastic that is mixed with uh, general household uh, waste that might include dirty nappies and all sorts of other you know, gross and unsanitary uh, items, well, in that case, that, that waste won't be processed and indeed it will end up being dumped or, or burned with massive implications, which um, Yun Yun will uh, discuss in more detail uh, later. But let me just turn to um, what we mean by leased plastic waste, because, you know, as I said, this is uh, the shipping abroad of waste is not a new practice and in, in itself is not is not illegal. This is something that has been happening for decades. But there are conventions and legislations, including export and import uh, bans, that actually regulate transboundary movement as well as the treatment of waste. Uh, among all, the most uh, uh, important, I would say, is the Basel Convention, which prohibits the movement of hazardous waste from OECD countries and the EU to uh, developing countries. Importantly, this convention has 187 uh, parties, countries that are parties of this convention, but there is a notable exception, which is the United States. Uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, the EU, which is of course part of the Basel Convention, took an even more stringent uh, approach. Uh, as, as a result, EU countries can only export to non-OECD countries what is classified to be clean plastic waste. And of course, because there are all these rules and regulations, when uh, authorities or companies uh, uh, break those rules, they commit illegal activities, which fall under two broad categories. The illegal trade, which violates import and export bans, and also the illegal treatments, which might involve the illegal disposal or incineration of, um, uh, of waste. So I've mentioned, you know, there are also, you know, national level uh, policies that uh, control uh, the movement of, of waste. And I think the most uh, significant, I would say, is China's national sword uh, policy, which was introduced in, 20, uh, in, in 2018. And uh, this policy really was a game changer for the waste industry. And basically it was China's uh, weapons to stop the country from becoming a landfill for nations uh, that would export contaminated and hazardous waste alongside with plastic. So what happened uh, is that through this uh, new policy, uh, China stopped accepting the imports of 24 types of solid waste, including eight categories of plastic waste, which include you know, everyday use plastic from the plastic that you find in water bottles and shampoo bottles or carrier bags and takeaway containers and so on and so forth. And as I said, this was a massive game changer because up until that point, China was receiving about half of the world waste. And, and, and as you can see from the graphic on your screen, already when the policy was announced in 2017, there was a decrease. And certainly there was a massive, massive decrease in waste imports in China in 2018 when, when, the, uh, when the policy came into, uh, into effect. But of course, you know, we still produce a huge amount of waste and that waste needed to find a new destination. And so this uh, policy meant implemented by, by China meant that a domino uh, effect started. So uh, countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, or the Philippines overnight uh, became uh, new recycling destinations for most of uh, North America and European uh, plastic. But this domino effect did not stop there. As you can see from uh, from this map, you know we have tried to uh, to trace uh, key uh, illicit flows of uh, of plastic waste. And one thing that I hope st uh, stands out is the truly you know international connection and the presence of multiple destinations and in the intermediate uh, points. 
So Asia and Southeast Asia in particular do remain key destinations, uh, but also countries in Africa, but also countries such as Turkey have in recent years begun to play a growing role in this trade. And evidence suggests that Eastern Europe, specifically countries such as Romania and Bulgaria, but also uh, Poland, are becoming destinations for uh, illicit plastic waste. And it is also in these countries where we see um, quite a bit of evidence around the involvement of organized crime groups. So this trajectory might suggest the, the growing importance of, of European countries and their um, uh, immediate uh, neighbors uh, in this illicit trading plastic. But this should not give the, the impression that um, the flows to Asia are declining because the, the continent really remains the number one uh, destination. What is, however, interesting to note that because a number of national level bans, import bans, have been introduced in some of these South Asia, Southeast Asian countries, and here I should add a note that you know they've seen varying degrees of, uh, of success, it, it is possible that these routes will actually simply be redirected to countries where uh, the uh, debate around illicit plastics uh, imports, uh, as well as their um, wider implications, is still nascent. So during our interviews uh, with uh, people on the ground, it, it appeared that countries such as Laos or Myanmar, might, where there have already been some detections, might be the ones to watch. And Myanmar is a particularly interesting one because, of course, the country is undergoing significant turbulence following the uh, uh, the coup in February, but there is a sense that the government is preparing to, dere to deregulating um, the imports of, of foreign uh, of, of foreign waste, which might uh, place Myanmar more on the map when it comes to uh, illicit uh, trade flows as well uh, for plastic. Uh, looking it further into the future, I think flows towards Africa are likely to also increase. Um, of course, there are already flows going to, to Africa at the moment of, of plastic, often alongside established routes, for instance, in terms of electronic waste that from Canada, Europe, or, or, the, or the US would reach uh, uh, West Africa. But there are also countries that perhaps are not yet receiving illicit plastic waste, such as Zambia which is certainly one that we'll be monitoring closely, but uh, that have actually uh, seen a, a large increase or proliferation in, uh, in the number of recycling um, uh, plants. Usually uh, these are foreign companies, most of which are, are Chinese, and environmental agencies on the ground uh, wonder how long it would take before Zambia will actually run out of domestic uh, uh, plastic to feed this growing industry and you know illicit uh, imports will uh, be encouraged to sustain these uh, this industry. But I'll now say a few words about the types of, of, of crimes that are committed along the uh, along the supply chain. There are two main categories of culprits. The main one is actually represented by legitimate entities, and these are uh, legitimate, you know, brokers, uh, recycling and, and waste management companies, but also uh, officials like customs officials, uh, port authorities that might uh, take bribes to facilitate the transit of certain uh, forbidden um, consignments. And the crimes that are committed inv usually involves misdeclaring the content of a container or concealing uh, hazardous plastic in the midst of other uh, material that is not subject to restrictions, such as you know, uh, paper waste or, or metal scraps, also concealing the origin of a shipment, and also uh, illegal dump dumping, incinerations, and a whole host of um, um, uh, economic or financial crimes, such as misinvoicing, money laundering, tax evasion, etc. But we've also seen the organized criminal groups uh, that are becoming more and more involved in the waste trade. This is not entirely new because already the Italian mafia in the 70s was very much embedded in the waste, uh, in the waste sector. But what we've seen more and more uh, in, in recent years is that in addition to a more traditional approach whereby criminal groups would use legitimate company as a front uh, for their activities and in particular for money laundering, um, we have seen a convergence with other non-white collar forms of crimes, things such as drug trafficking, human trafficking, modern slavery. And there was an interesting case that we uh, identified in the course of the research pointing to a UK based uh, criminal group that was using, uh, that had set up a waste management company with a partner 
partner company in Turkey, and basically they would ship waste to, to Turkey, but actually uh, we would hide in the midst of plastic waste, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, um, uh, cannabis, uh, steroids, which would then reach Turkey, and from there they would move on to the Middle East and other um, drug consumer markets. And there are other examples that we can discuss in the Q&A. But this is just to give you a, a flavor of the uh, extent and the variety of, of crimes that are committed along the supply chain of illicit uh, plastic waste. I'll now pass uh, the floor on to Yun Yun to discuss the impact that all of these activities uh, have on the countries uh, receiving uh, illicit waste. Good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Um, uh, thank you so much, um, um, GI Talk, for inviting me um, to this event. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. I hope it's uh, you can see it. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Please introduce, I'd like to introduce myself. My, my name is Yuya Nismawati. I'm from uh, the Nexus 3 Foundation, Nexus for Health, Environment and Development. Um, um, my organization is based in Indonesia. Um, and uh, we've been, um, we're celebrating the 21 years of our uh, anniversary this year. <clears throat> uh, I would like to skip this because um, uh, uh, it's already introduced at the beginning. So uh, as Virginia uh, uh, already explained that uh, after the China, um, after the China uh, export ban, uh, all the waste has been shifted to um, Asia and um, Southeast Asia countries, Southeast Asian countries mostly, and then um, recently to Africa. And reactions from various countries are very, um, very much um, covered by the media. And this is triggered to the new rules and the, the Basel uh, Convention. Um, I would like to share um, the situation in Indonesia, um, which I think more or less also representing the situation in the uh, recipient countries or the imported, importing countries. Uh, in Indonesia, the Association of Plastic Industry um, uh, and the Ministry of Industry uh, recorded that um, to be able to recycle plastics in Indonesia, the industry use virgin materials as well as the uh, post-consumer plastics uh, that's imported from uh, various countries. And to process this, um, uh, there are hundreds of um, more than 900 uh, companies uh, exist in Indonesia uh, and spread out um, in various uh, big cities near ports uh, of Indonesia. Uh, the majority uh, located in uh, West Jaffa, as you see in the map, uh, and near Jakarta. Uh, and also the red dot is representing Batam Island, which is the uh, special economic zone where um, importers have to import and also export 100% of their products. Um, the interesting thing for me is that uh, through this plastic recycling industry, we, um, we identified that about 7 million tons of plastics produced every year. Uh, and Indonesia have or generated about 9 million of plastic waste um, annually, uh, and only 9% of this uh, being recycled. Um, in this chart, you can see that uh, from local recycling, uh, it's about 13%, but probably it's less than that. Um, but um, information about how many plastics being recycled locally, um, it's very difficult to obtain. Um, this is the pictures from the ground. If you go to several places um, where uh, plastic factories or paper factories located, 
Um, you can also see from uh, the Google map or the Google Earth if you want, um, but this is the situations on the ground. Uh, the top left is the uh, landfill of a paper company where they dumped the, the contaminants from the plastic bales, uh, from the paper bales. Um, it's a big landfill, um, privately run by uh, a paper company, which is uncommon in Indonesia, but they get the permit or not, we don't know. Um, and uh, on the right side, this is the uh, uh, paper imported by um, uh, a small medium company, uh, which shows that uh, the mixture or the contaminant could be more than 40%. Um, and because the unwanted plastics are not, um, uh, because the plastics are not the major uh, materials that needed by paper companies, uh, the residuals of uh, unwanted plastics are uh, maybe it's about 30% of their capacity every day. It's like this, um, the bottom right. And this amount being transferred to the neighboring villages. Um, in some cases, also near um, rice fields, uh, like the picture on the bottom left. Um, this is the picture from, I'm sorry, I cover it a little bit. Um, so this is from Indah Kiat uh, in Serang near Jakarta. Uh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to type 2021. Uh, that's the coordinate. Later, you can try to Google it as well. Uh, what I would like to point it out here is this area on the left with the yellow pin. Uh, this is the situation in 2015, and this is the factory. As you can see, it's progressing <laughs> over a period of time. Um, within six years, you can see the difference from the green area over here and then covered by waste little by little. And then it's growing until uh, 2021, which is um, the situation like this. Uh, this is on the ground. So why they have this kind of um, uh, situations, uh, I'd like to take it back a little bit. So you can see that this is green area before in 2015. And if we uh, think about um, the China sword um, and then the green fence uh, in China, you can see the growing um, residuals of waste. And Indah Kiat is a paper company. And if we see on the ground, the piles like this, um, I don't know what to say anymore <laughs> uh, because I don't know whether this is uh, uh, um, an additional extra containers which they receive or bought or purchase or even maybe free of charge because um, the exporters want to dump um, the mixed plastics and mixed waste, uh, mixed paper. And because um, at that time, during this period of time, uh, between 2017-2018, Indonesian regulations have loopholes that allowed um, mixed um, plastics uh, followed into the containers of uh, paper. Uh, another situation um, I'd like to share also, at the, uh, this is also near Jakarta, uh, the dumping site of Harvest Indo International and the new Harvest Indo International. So there are two plastic companies side by side, uh, which we investigated for a couple of years, uh, for a number of years. And um, I'm sorry, uh, you can see, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the red uh, circle here. Maybe it's not that clear uh, from the screen, but if you can see, this is the situation in 2010. And then since 2014, they started to use that site as the dumping site. And then growing and growing and growing, oops, in 2017, uh, I heard from the local source that they have uh, conflicts um, and complaints from the neighborhoods. So they closed down that uh, dumping site. But interestingly, it was developed uh, as a real estate. So now it's housing for some people. Can you imagine if you live on top of the former landfills? Um, it's it's crazy. We went to the field and then we were surprised that two years ago when we were when we were there, it was still um, uh, a dumping site. And then when we went there again uh, in 2020, 
it has already uh, built lots of houses. Um, and this is the situation that we see more and more uh, in many places. This is the location of, um, sorry, um, the company that received uh, shipments from BIFA. Um, if you remember the BIFA case um, uh, last month has um, a monumental um, fine for, for uh, a company in the UK. And uh, that has been fined for one and a half million um, counseling because they had already violated a couple of times. So these are the company that receive, this is also a paper company. They receive uh, shipments with lots of contaminants like this. Um, and it's go on and on and on <laughs> the list. Um, I think in many uh, developing countries also, we see the same uh, cases. Um, and because those unwanted waste, um, there is no regulations, there is no requirement how to handle it. Uh, so companies dumped it uh, in the neighborhoods and burn it occasionally. Um, sometimes it was burned uh, intentionally by the communities because they are looking for metals uh, in, the, um, in the mixture of uh, waste there. And sometimes also um, it's just um, ignited because uh, self-ignited because of the hot weather and the mix mixture of waste. Um, in many cases also, like in Malaysia and in other countries, um, the communities are affected by the smoke and then by the, um, because it's a mix of everything. So the smoke uh, uh, affecting people and vulnerable people, especially children. So these students from one of the schools nearby at the dumping sites, uh, they were hospitalized because they all uh, suffered from respiratory problem. Um, and when the plastics are recycled, it's not really 100% safe uh, because um, most plastics are containing plastic additives that are considered um, harmful chemicals. And some of them are um, EDCs, uh, classified as EDCs, uh, endocrine disruptor chemicals. Um, we visited one factory um, near near the Bantar Gebang uh, or the landfill near Jakarta, they recycled 30 tons of plastic waste, uh, plastic bags, and converted into six tons of PE pallets. But when you entered the factory, you can, uh, uh, my, I got sore throat and then uh, my eyes got um, watery and, and it's smelly and, and not comfortable. And then when we interviewed the workers, they work 24 hours in three shift. So they work in the evening as well. So this uh, situation also taking place in a big uh, um, recycling uh, company. And for burning plastics, um, we understand that um, it emits a lot of uh, toxic chemicals. So we collected samples on the ground um, and collected eggs because uh, chicken eggs are very good um, biomarkers. And we found that the uh, uh, samples from uh, one of the sites in East Jaffa have the highest um, dioxins, um, the fifth highest um, in the world after a couple of sites here. Um, and they use it for alternative fuel. Another chemicals that we detected in the uh, eggs in that locations are uh, flame retardants. Uh, can you imagine you find flame retardants in the eggs and you eat it every day? Uh, and no standards about this. Um, so the government have to work harder to set the standards and prevent um, and protect the communities. So IPEN is calling for the elimination of the toxic impact um, of chemicals in every phase of plastics uh, life cycle. So from the extractions until uh, the recycling, as explained before by uh, Virginia also, there are actors um, that involve in every process. Um, and in Indonesia, there are laws, there are regulations already established, um, including the regulations to import uh, plastic waste and paper waste. Um, however, the enforcement is not as strong as we expected. Um, this is the situation that you can see. And sometimes um, uh, press releases or press conference also uh, organized by the Ministry of Environment and the authority to showcase that uh, they enforce the law. However, when we try to follow the decisions of the court, 
uh, we couldn't find any uh, follow-up evidence and verdict of the court. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Looking forward um, to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Yun. Um, that's quite shocking. And I, I would suggest that um, from your very direct experience in Indonesia, actually what we're finding and what you are finding is that you are also seeing this quite widespread across Southeast Asia and then other countries as well. So thank you for that case study example, but the scale of it in Indonesia and then further beyond is really quite something to, to try and take on board. Um, Willie, um, if you would like to, to give us your perspectives from your, uh, your 40 years of experience, that would be very welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise, uh, and, and thanks to GI Talk uh, for inviting me here today. Um, I've been engaged in this area since 2008, um, and I've witnessed the, the growing challenge and threat uh, from the trade in illicit waste uh, since that time. Uh, certainly over the last three to five years, uh, it's become increasingly challenging uh, when we've seen the changes in plastic waste exports uh, following on from uh, uh, China's uh, Operation Swords in 2018. Um, that has seen the rise uh, of a dynamic and very flexible and nimble trade in, in, in plastics uh, globally. Uh, that's also seen a rise of uh, professional criminal classes that were engaged at different levels within that process. But how do we challenge that? And that's, that's the real, real problem here that we face today. Uh, what are we doing to combat illicit trade? Uh, Virginia mentioned the role of the Basel Convention and the enabling legislation that is nested within that, that allows competent authorities within countries to monitor, inspect, uh, and stop uh, uh, illegal waste shipments and to deal with them at the point of receipt uh, in uh, countries that are receiving um, uh, suspected illegal waste movements. The competent authorities in the main are the environmental regulators in, in nation states. And they are, in many cases, ill-equipped uh, poorly resourced uh, and don't have the necessary tools and expertise to deal with this form of criminality. Because as I've said, it's very nimble, very flexible, and there are elements within that that are uh, organized crime and, and in nature and involve the sophisticated systems and processes that organized crime use when in dealing in other commodity streams. How then can an environmental regulator challenge that and deal with that, investigate it, and bring the necessary evidence together for that? Is it any wonder that environmental regulators find themselves challenged in a day-to-day, week-to-week basis? And in the interim period, the market moves and other countries are then faced with this growing threat. Um, I've seen mentioned within the slides uh, the, during the presentation by Virginia uh, of the emerging challenges and, and threats in Central Europe. And that's just a, yet another example of the market changing when restrictions are placed uh, by states in Southeast Asia, the market demands that the waste is moved somewhere else. And we've seen the situation now growing in, in, uh, in Europe, the waste that was otherwise going to China, then to Southeast Asia, and then in turn being fed into Central Europe and Eastern Europe uh, states to deal with. Uh, and that's just frankly not good enough because there is incumbent on the nation states within these waste producing countries to deal with the waste in the most uh, environmentally sound and efficient manner. And steps have to be taken to ensure that that's, that that's in play. Um, in recent years, we have come together uh, regionally and globally to challenge this. Uh, and I'm been engaged for the last five years in, in working with Interpol's Pollution Crime Working Group, uh, and we have tackled as best we can uh, the growing threat from pollution crime, in particular waste crime. And in recent years, that's focused on, on plastics. Uh, this year alone, 67 states came together, 300 agencies came together globally uh, to take concerted action in this area. Uh, and while that's commendable and while that's to be 
uh, uh, addressed as potential best practice going forward and it should become business as usual, it's just scratching the surface. Uh, enforcement on its own is not enough. The challenge for the environmental regulator and for law enforcement agencies working with them is does it does it achieve a meaningful reduction in the throughput of this material? And the answer is no, not at this time. Um, so it lies in, with nation states in terms of that to actually deal with the, the, the product that they produce internally and deal with it more efficiently. I had hoped, like Union, uh, that we would see significant changes or, or a significant new policies emerging from COP26, but that's not been the case uh, in that regard. Uh, the future has to be uh, with better engagement at all levels. Um, I would see that the nature of the criminality is such that agencies uh, have to share information, have to share intelligence, not just law enforcement agencies to law enforcement agency, but across the board with, with industry itself. And I'll touch on that in the conclusions and recommendations. Uh, the challenges that we face are not uh, reducing, they are in fact growing. And as we've seen the rise and rise of plastic production, and Virginia touches on, on her report, that the cost of the virgin material itself is actually cheaper than the recycle it, but in an invidious position where the recycling markets and industries that we thought would be in play just now to uh, enable uh, uh, us to have sustainable uh, production and reuse of plastics are not in play. Uh, China took the bulk of this material up until 2018, and we're now left with the consequences of them rightly closing their borders to that waste product. And we find ourselves in a position that the nations themselves don't have the recycling capability in state and they've reverted back to the previous model, of just to export it in some shape or form. That's not to say the EU and the EU uh, uh, states are doing uh, significant work to combat that. We've seen the EU policy on, on plastics. Uh, a number of states are in, in, uh, invoking different models in terms of their plastic strategy to bring about a circular economy model in play. But there will be a lag before the benefits of that are seen, uh, I, I fear, and that, that that challenge will go on for years to come. Um, any questions? I, I've noted the fact that, you know, the, the comment about waste brokers, and, and so I'll mention that, but also the role of big business, uh, because that's the, the, the thrust of that question, I think. Uh, brokers play an important role uh, in the and the facilitation and the negotiation and, and shipment of waste uh, across borders. Road brokers uh, are engaged in the transit of illicit plastic waste across these borders. And in, 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 inherent in that is the mislabeling, the misclassification, misdescription of paperwork. It involves document fraud, it involves corrupt practices, it involves deceit. Uh, and in the process of that, waste is transferred to, to states such as Indonesia, who are left with the, the, the very bleak uh, and, and, and consequences of, of that process. But it's not just the brokers, because companies at either end of that process, either at the production and in the recycling and in the, in the decision to then pass it on to brokers, uh, are doing this uh, in often complicit terms. So it's not the brokers are to blame. Uh, there are those that decide to look the other way. The old adage, if a deal's too good to be true, uh, walk away. But sadly, people are not walking away because they can't because they've locked themselves into potentially contracts where they have to recycle and, uh, and push the waste on. And they take a decision that is perhaps unpartable, but also perhaps makes a uh, significant profit to that. So much more needs to be done in terms of regulation of brokers and in terms of regulation uh, of uh, the, the entire cycle because the, the, it's incumbent under the Basel Convention and under the enabling legislation that, that different states have for that duty of care to be seen to be effective and seen to be active. And that unfortunately is not the case at times for that. Can you go on to the next slide, please? Um, 
Union paints a, a bleak picture that has been witnessed throughout the world, uh, and I've called it a pandemic waste crime, so, because I believe it is that now. This is a contagion that's spreading globally, uh, much like COVID-19. And uh, I draw the parallel not to be, uh, not to be outlandish, but to actually say that this is really what this is, because this is a this is a, 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 a throughput of of a, a contagious challenge, a, a toxic substance, a toxic material um, that is traveling around the world and, and looking for a final home um, and has been nested within the waters and lands of countries ill-equipped to deal with it, that's finding its way into the marine environment and polluting our seas and oceans. So therefore, it requires not just national, but international, regional collaboration. Uh, I've touched on the work that the Interpol Pollution Craig Working Group has been doing, but that's been witnessed elsewhere within uh, and across Southeast Asia and beyond in terms of uh, uh, neighbouring states coming together, combining uh, in the face of this plastics uh, uh, pandemic and in terms of combining together and bringing about uh, more, in, in more effective restrictions to stop this material coming to the shores. Uh, the challenge, however, when you look at law enforcement agencies and other agencies combining together is their ability to share information, their ability to use respective resources and skills that they have, their expertise and the different legislation that they can bring together in, a, in an effective way. The work that's been seen is fragmented, it's, it's patchy, and at the end of the day, Enforcement alone, compliance alone can't do the, the, the work for us. Prevention is, is the cure here, whether it's changing material at source, whether it's reducing use, or whether it's through looking at packaging and particularly the use of single use uh, plastics. These are all steps that have to be taken. Um, and unions touched on the uh, on the toxic nature of, of, of the materials when, when these processes are not in play when the recycling markets are not uh, 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 in action as we've seen just now. One of the areas that Virginia looked at was the electronic tracking of waste and I think it should be mandatory and, that, and again I should say that these are my views and not necessarily those of any agency that I've worked for or, or supported uh, because the business itself in terms of this plastic trade is very much paper-based uh, and very much a 20th century model. Uh, and so the electronic tracking of, of, of these waste shipments and the monitoring of them by regulators and by law enforcement bodies is a requirement and it would assist greatly. Is it, is it a silver bullet? Certainly not. Um, I, don't, I don't think that will ever be the case. And there's always the fear uh, that that in turn can become hacked and subverted in some way. But the challenge that we've seen is that the industry itself is under so much stress and pressure. One, at the end of the virgin production, uh, the increased production of, 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 the, uh, of plastics themselves and, and the benefits to the petrochemical industry in the terms of moving away from uh, petrol uh, and diesel within vehicles, the move towards ele electric vehicles, and the movement by that industry towards saying plastics is a, is a solution to our our, our supply challenge here. So something has to be done within that, at, at, at not just government, but at corporate levels as well, in terms of what are we doing uh, as, a, as, a, as a global society in terms of doing this, because it's the poorest countries that are suffering as a consequence of this. Uh, therefore, I think it's incumbent that we engage with the private sector at all levels, um, and that, the West in particular needs to provide leadership, needs to provide direction and needs to be seen to be doing something more than it is at the moment. It is incumbent on countries that are producing the waste to deal with the waste and to deal with the waste in a strategic and meaningful manner so that the countries that uh, the, the union represents effectively here today are not left to, to take on this, uh, this burden. I want to touch on, uh, finally in my closing remarks, you just touch on the work the union and others in the NGO area do. Um, the challenge that I've seen is that 
law enforcement agencies and worldwide agencies such as Europol, who are dealing with the impact program, tackling environmental crime, Interpol in terms of its pollution work and so on, and national agencies keep at arm's length the NGOs, and, and there are good reasons for that on both sides. But I've been struck, in, particularly in the last year, in dealing with the Union, dealing with uh, Ina Van Tulen, the Indonesian Waste Platform, Jan Dell, um, and, and, and others in the other NGO world in terms of the, the impact and the evidence that they can bring to this problem and their vital role in communicating this threat and this danger to uh, the wider public. Because I think that's at the heart of where we will see change taking place. We collectively have to bring pressure and attention to this problem. And I think working with more closely in some way with the NGOs, with the private sector, not just the producers and the recyclers, but also those involved in the logistical supply chain, that, that can help. I think there's a role that I've seen when I've worked in the wildlife crime areas and, stuff, and the, the, the benefits that can be done working with those in the transport industry, working with those in the financial sector and bringing about suspicious activity reporting tools and mechanisms that can be brought to bear in these other illicit trafficking areas and brought to bear into the waste world. So much can be done, but it, let's go back to my original point, it requires leadership because we need to better understand the, the big picture, as it were, of what is happening because it's, it's changing from month to month. Um, I, I'm intrigued with the questions that were coming in and I hope that together we can propose some other recommendations, conclusions that we can take forward and that this report doesn't start and end today, but it goes on in some shape or form and that we can add to that bank of knowledge and that we can add to the, the, the great work that's already been done because more is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Um, I really like the way that you set out that there's a number of different actions across the whole, not only of the supply chain, but then also of the of the kind of actors involved because they are numerous. Um, and I think that that was really interesting to see how, you know, a combined forces of all of those things could actually make a bit of a difference here. And it's absolutely our intention also that this report isn't just one that is kind of read and put to the side. Um, um, but it, it continues to have the impact. And on that, Virginia, there's a question uh, that was asked in the q and I think, um, which is a little bit pointing to that direction. What are we going to do about some of the findings in your report? And could you answer that one for us, please? Of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Louise. And, and as you said, this is certainly not a fire and forget report. We'll build on this and we'll do more and more work. And it's great to see uh, the interactions and the comments and people are, are putting it in the chat and we want really to take the conversation uh, forward. Um, so, yes, there is a question about you know, uh, evidence. Of course, we already have plenty of evidence. We have produced this report. Many other organizations have produced report that point at, at, the, at this issue. Um, but how, how are we going to fix the problem? I think, you know, uh, for those of you who have already read the report, it doesn't make for a happy reading. Uh, it is quite uh, pessimistic, uh, to be honest, because I've also come to the same conclusion. There is plenty of, of evidence, but the financial incentives uh, are such that it's likely they will continue as you know, human beings to heavily uh, rely on, uh, on plastics. And this is not going to decrease going forward. And I'm saying this based on trends that we'll be we have been observing, especially with regards to, uh, you know, um, the fracking and shale gas market in the US, byproduct of which is the production of some of the critical uh, feedstock for plastics. So which means that, you know, we'll have greater availability of these feedstocks. It will be even cheaper and cheaper to produce uh, virgin plastic like uh, Willie has um, uh, as, as already uh, indicated. So there is not a great incentive towards, um, towards recycling. And, and recycling already, we know it's a myth, 
uh, to uh, paraphrase a recent uh, documentary that has been uh, released. And, uh, and there are no incentives to increase a domestic recycling capacity in Europe and the US. So we need to be a creative and look at things that we could do. And, they, and, and I would like to touch also on the other question that was asked, um, you know, because of course it's all well and good to target the small fish and the brokers, but it's the big companies that we need to, to go after. And uh, Willie has already discussed this, but what I would add on top of it, that because of the sophistication of these businesses, we are talking about not just small companies, we are talking about large companies with, you know, uh, shell companies, parent companies with uh, transnational uh, uh, operations. And so we need uh, to uh, equip the environmental agency, the regulators or law enforcement in, in different countries that are responsible, they're charged with dealing with, with waste crime to actually have the tools, the technical tools to deal with these uh, with these issues. Because uh, sometimes uh, um, officers within a country's environmental agency might not have the uh, financial uh, expertise to actually follow the money and to actually look into the financial transactions uh, related to, to this business. So I think there is an issue of increasing capacity uh, in that sense. Thank you, Virginia. Um, the, I would uh, draw your attention to some of the, the Q&A in which uh, Yu Yun has very kindly answered some of the questions in there. And as Virginia mentioned, there is also um, a discussion going on in the chat, which I would draw your attention to. Uh, Jella, you have your uh, hand raised and I wondered if you uh, would like to ask your question and would you like to introduce yourself and then point it to whom you would like to answer, to answer the question, please. Over to you. Claudio, I'm not sure if we can facilitate Jelle on asking the question live. Mm. My apologies for it's po it's quite possibly uh, my incompetence with the with the platform here. Um, okay, uh, Jelle, would it be possible for you to pop your question in the Q and A? Because then, for absolutely, we get, we'll be able to see it. In the meantime, Yu Yun, there was a question here from Pu Yi about uh, the use of plastic for fuel. Uh, would you be able to, uh, to have a look at that and answer that for us, please? Yes, uh, there, are, um, uh, there are suggestions or recommendations from uh, the, the government, the Indonesian government, uh, when, when we release our report that the unwanted plastic waste um, imported by paper companies uh, were dumping uh, dumped into the neighborhoods. So the government recommended that the company have to use it for their own purposes, for their boilers and so on. The problem with that is uh, that plastic, when, when burn 100% in the boilers, um, it will create a technical problem because it's sticky. So the, um, the, the boilers will be sticky and the, the emissions um, into the stack have to be cleaned periodically. It, it creates another hassles uh, for company who use 100% of plastics uh, for their uh, uh, boilers or electricity or incinerators. Um, so it's not 100% solve the problem. Uh, and also when um, in one of my slides, I showed um, one of the pictures where actually that's the process of um, destroying three containers, um, sorry, nine containers, confiscated containers uh, done by the plastic company Harvest Indo. It took them three days to burn nine containers and they still have 1050 containers. Uh, to be burned. So how are you going to do that? And that is not only uh, the issue, the one that have already spread out. This is also um, happening in, in other countries, right? So, but what was the decision of the Malaysian government when they found a lot of abandoned um, uh, recycling plants? So there is no other way than sending it to the landfill. So it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not as, as easy or simple um, to burn mm -hmm. it in the boilers or incinerators because it, it will require uh, another step. Thanks, Yu Yun. Um, Jelle has um, kindly put the question in the, in the 
in the Q&A, which relates to that, actually, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on it, which is there are a few instances of governments actually receiving waste which were completely against what was agreed in, you know, in their original contract. What do you think uh, could be done about that and what measures could receiving countries do about that? Yeah, it's uh, again, as I mentioned in my slides, uh, it's law enforcement uh, is important. Um, but since the 1st of uh, January 2021, uh, developing countries have um, the opportunity to use their rights to ask for uh, pre-informed consent. So importers are uh, allowed to ask, or countries and the authorities allowed to ask the exporting countries to describe what's in the shipment. Um, so, so you have to ask more questions about uh, percentage of contaminants and potential contaminants in the containers, um, because describing 2% uh, contaminants or 5% contaminant only is not enough. Um, so importing countries should ask what's inside uh, um, the containers and potential um, contaminants. For instance, liquids from hazardous waste packaging, oils or um, electronics um, being smashed or crashed um, together with uh, paper waste. We've seen it uh, in several cases. Um, so that kind of explanations or descriptions have to be provided by the exporters. Um, and the importing countries have to set the standards. So um, the roadmap to follow China's step um, to set the, the contaminant standards from one and a half percent to zero percent in three years time, it's a good example. Um, and, and countries, developing countries should exercise that. Thank you. Thanks, Yuyun. Um, so we're, we're actually running out of time, for which apologies, and if we haven't managed to answer your question, then I do apologise, but Willie, I know that you wanted to come back and uh, you had some additional thoughts on how we might be able to use the report uh, more actively. Yes, uh, thanks Louise. Yeah, it's, um, Virginia and I were asked to um, join the US uh, State Department's interagency uh, group on plastics uh, last week to talk about the report and to spell out the implications of that to that US audience. And that to me is a, is a, is a good example of speaking truth to power, um, if, if it could be so grand uh, in that regard. And, and we pulled no punches in terms of the US's role within that uh, area and what we at least perceived from the, the basis of the report and from our own experience uh, thought about what the US could do. So I think more of the same is needed there. Um, the, the challenge that uh, individual states have is that they can't see the horizon. Um, they are too busy dealing with the problem in front of their faces at the minute, uh, and that changes week to week, as I've said. So there is significant benefit in reports of this nature that can uh, um, environmentally scan, that can provide some uh, thinking on it, that can and if it's not too grand, recommendations to, to go forward. And that all adds to that policy thinking and to that legislative review process that needs to be live and needs to be um, quicker uh, in responding to this problem. Um, relying on legislation written in the 20th century does not work for a 21st century problem. Um, and we have to be better able at looking at this, that strategic intelligence, that strategic information, mm -hmm. and then saying, what do we do next now? And does it require a further review? Or do we actually need to look urgently at policy change? Whether it's in the EU looking at the throughput of waste material that's now traveling, transiting towards Central Europe, something needs to be done there. How do you manage that in a Schengen uh, uh, borderless state environment? something needs to happen what is it and so the reports of this nature generate that discussions and i think that's that's the that's the future and that's why gi talk uh, does and, and will play an important role in this thanks really um uh, i absolutely agree with that and in terms of sort of potentially helpful uh, recommendations that we could make um one of the questions is around um sort of uh, risk analysis and profiling in terms of money laundering through um, and it's actually something that we could make a recommendation to FATF around in terms of including these in sort of national AML and counter-terrorist financing risk assessments. So I think that's something that we could 
definitely take forward. So thank you for the suggestion uh, on that or the question on that. Um, I have very one last very quick question, quick fire to all of you from somebody uh, that's come in. What is one immediate thing that you would suggest as an action to implement right away that could make a bit of a difference here? I will go to you, Yu Yun first, then to Willie, then to Virginia. Thank you. Uh, I think um, in the destination countries or um, I should say developing countries um, should check the list of companies that registered as plastic recyclers or paper recyclers or paper manufacturing companies that need uh, materials from abroad um, and check. It's like, um, I think, the Malaysian government did the right things about this. First, they check uh, all the necessary um, permits that they need to have. And then from, from that list, they can um, renew the regulations or the permit for them to import and check the quota. Because in some countries, um, uh, the companies or the manufacturers allowed to import 50% of their installed capacity. In some other countries, only 25% allowed to import um, uh, the materials from other countries, uh, from recyclables or from virgin materials. Uh, that need to be set. Uh, but on top of it, um, the recycling system in every country have to be improved, meaning that the collections and then waste separations from source um, is very important, not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries, because the one that shipped from the global north to the global south are still a mixed waste. It means the recycling system is also broken in, in the global north. So it, it takes... Um, uh, everyone's role to participate in this act, uh, uh, in this event to improve everything. But um, that's at least what I can suggest um, briefly for to address the, the companies. Yeah, the receiving states to sort of do a quick fire, you know, through flush, if you like, or cleaning of the, of the system at their end. That's great. Thank you. Willie, what do you think? Yeah, I certainly echo Union's comments there. Um, and for those states and agencies that are coming to this uh, to fetch is to identify who the competent authorities are in your respective countries um, and to engage with them. Uh, and if you don't know who they are, deal with the, the Basel Institute of Governance who will, who will put you in touch with them and, and, and provide guidance and support about what to do because there's is that capacity and capability area of, you know, of supporting the competent authorities uh, and working with them. So one, identifying the competent authorities in the states, engaging with them, uh, supporting with them, and messaging to those in power in, in your respective countries the, the, the threat and the challenge. Because without highlighting it, you're not going to get the support you need, you're not going to get the resources you need, and you're not going to make a difference um, because working together certainly achieves more. And, and then that Basel communication sort of, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, global organization I'm, I'm yeah. speaking about. It's important that also at the same point as unions made there is to reach out to the exporting states to engage with that dialogue because given the new amendments that are in play from January uh, 21, the, that prior informed consent requires by definition a dialogue uh, between the, the relevant competent states. Uh, the competent authorities rather. So that's important to engage with them. Uh, and if you don't have the means of communication, um, seek that out via, whether it's an Interpol or National Central Bureau, so we'll reach out on your behalf, uh, or through Basel uh, governance itself. Thank you, love it. So we've got receiving end, we've got regulatory action um, and a coordination in the middle. Virginia, what are you gonna tell us? Well, I'd like just to bring us back to what you said in the introduction, Louise, because you may have made reference to the fact that sometimes this type of crime is seen as, is seen as a bit niche, it's not as bad as other forms of crimes. I would argue that what we need is actually uh, more intelligence and to deepen our understanding of actually the criminal component of this trade. And I'm talking about the criminal uh, activities carried out by organized crime group, not so much about the companies uh, in this context, because this is a question that 
that I've asked every single person I've interviewed in the course of the research. Many people didn't have an answer because normally they immediately think of waste crime and white collar crime. But actually this is not, I don't think this is because of a lack of organized crime involvement, but more of a lack of information around it. Because when you start digging deeper, you find evidence such as the things I mentioned earlier in the introduction with the convergence with drugs. But there are also cases where people who have been uh, trafficked, vulnerable, pe vulnerable people who have been trafficked, who actually end up working in a recycling and sorting plants. So there is a convergence there. We just don't collect enough data. Um, about it and the by being, you know, because there are different agencies as already uh, highlighted by the Willy that, that deal with, with different things and they might operate in, in silos. So the border agency of a big given country might go and do an inspection at the recycling plant. They might identify there are some illegal workers, people who have been trafficked, but it might not occur to the border or into the immigration agency to actually inform their colleagues in the environmental agency and therefore that connection between waste and in this case uh, migrant smuggling or human trafficking is not made but it's there we just don't record it so i think greater collaboration that would lead to enhance uh, understanding of the criminal dimension is what is needed among the other things that we've mentioned today thank you Thank you. It seems like there's a lot to do, but um, I'm very heartened by the fact that we have three very dedicated people uh, on the call today that and a lot of people that have signed in, actually, and I can see that again from the passion and the commitment on the comments and the questions that we're not going to let this go. Actually, um, we are going to use this report as, as as part of that overall picture of taking this forward. So um, and I'm uh, absolutely 100 and 50% behind all of that. So um, thank you so much to everybody who came today, everybody who spoke and everybody who took the time to ask the questions. Um, it's not going away, but we're going to absolutely do our best to stop it uh, from growing and from taking some decent action uh, to, to prevent what's happening at the moment. So thank you so much. Uh, and I wish you all uh, a pleasant day. And I'm sure that we will be in touch again on this topic soon. Thank you. All the best. Goodbye. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Luis. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Virginia. Bye.